Good morning and welcome to this, the 29th meeting of the Equalities and Human Rights Committee of 2017. I have apologies from our convener, Christine McKelvey, and from the substitute member, Linda Fabiani. Uh, moving on to agenda item one, uh, human rights and the Scottish Parliament. Um, our first item of business today is an evidence session on the committee's forthcoming inquiry examining how the Scottish Parliament should scrutinise and uphold human rights. And we're very pleased to be joined this morning by a video conference link by Murray Hunt, who is director of the Birmingham Centre for the Rule of Law. Good morning to you, Murray. Can you hear us? Yeah, great. Murray was formerly the legal advisor to the UK's Parliament uh, Joint Committee on Human Rights and a visiting professor at the University of Oxford. He's giving evidence to today uh, based on his extensive practical knowledge and research experience in dealing with the rule of law issues both nationally and internationally, especially in the context in the role of Parliament. Um, so welcome again, Murray. Um, I'd just like to start with a, a bit of a soft opener. Um, if you could give us your view as to um, the current human rights landscape in Scotland, particularly in the context of Brexit, and then if you can give us some insight as to how you think this parliament, through this committee and beyond, um, can act better as the guarantor of human rights in Scotland, particularly in that context of that landscape. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Convener, and thank you very much to the committee for this opportunity to give evidence to you this morning. Very much appreciate that. Uh, can I just make one very, very small correction for the record? Um, I'm the director of the Bingham Centre for the Rule of Law rather than the Birmingham Centre uh, for the Rule of Law. <laughs> that was my mistake. <laughs> just as, that's, that's on the record. Um, it's named after Tom Bingham, of course, who, um, who, who is who's very well known and who gave a fantastically accessible account of, of the Rule of Law and what it means as a practical concept. Uh, so it's, it's the, the Bingham Centre. Um, so to, to, to turn to your opening question, Mr. Convener, the current human rights landscape um, in Scotland, um, like in many places, uh, is one of concern for those concerned with protection and promotion of human rights, I think. We're living in an age of, of many threats and challenges uh, posed to the rule of law and human rights. Uh, there's a concern, I think, about rollback of current levels of legal protections for human rights. There's a general retreat from international obligations, which seems to be something of a worldwide phenomenon. Um, and there is a rather alarming, I think, attack on many of the legal institutions in particular, on which we've relied for many years to protect uh, human rights and the rule of law. Um, so the general context um, is one broadly speaking, of concern for protections for human rights. Uh, and that's why, if I may say so, I think your inquiry, your committee's inquiry is so important. Uh, it's extremely important in this context to be focusing on what the role of parliaments and elected politicians in particular is in relation to the protection and promotion of human rights. And I think one of the most potent responses to the democratic critique of our institutions that protect human rights uh, is to focus on what the role of politicians should be and try to embed in the political process proper consideration of human rights matters so that politicians themselves can begin to take more ownership over the concepts in human rights treaties and human rights protections. So, and of course the, the, the immediate context of Brexit, I know your next panel is going to consider that in more detail in terms of its implications for equality and human rights, um, is one which does cause, raise many of these uh, questions and possible concerns about whether it does endanger the, the protection uh, for human rights which currently exists. So it's extremely important, I think, in that context that we do think about how parliaments can take a more active role in protecting and promoting human rights. Uh, and to turn to the second of your opening questions, um, there are many ways, I have a number of themes, I've read some very interesting um, papers in advance of this morning's hearing, uh, in particular the Scottish Human Rights Commission's submission to the Commission on Parliamentary Reform, which has a number of um, concrete suggestions and recommendations about how the Scottish Parliament itself uh, could respond to this challenge and take a more active role uh, in relation to protecting and promoting human rights. And I've got a number of specific themes which I'm sure will come to um, in, your, in your questions. But I think, if I may say so, you're asking exactly the right question. And there is a great opportunity for the Scottish Parliament, I think, to lead by example here. And I'm very encouraged by, uh, by the context of the Commission on Parliamentary Reforms uh, indication of the significance of the issue uh, and you're taking it up in this inquiry. 
Well, thank you for that uh, very comprehensive answer, Murray. Um, I think since the start of this session, this committee has recognised just how big and movable a feast um, the human rights agenda is. And, and if we are to act as guarantors on that, then we have to have a, a weather eye on all of that. Um, we looked at, in the early days of this committee at the fact that there are some 700 concluding observations um, on our progress or lack thereof against several of the human rights treaties to which we are a party. Um, and whilst we recognise there is a potential roadmap for both the work of this committee and the wider parliament in terms of affecting change which improves our um, obligations to those treaties, um, it's a bit difficult to really know where to start and how to do so uh, with efficacy, particularly as um, these, these concluding obs observations can um, be very big or, or deal with some of the minutiae. Do you have any recommendations as to how we sort of grapple with that and, uh, and where to begin? I think it's an excellent and very, very important question. Um, I worked for 13 years as the legal advisor to the Joint Committee on Human Rights in the Westminster Parliament, uh, and even by the end of that time was still grappling with, with that problem. Um, it is often overwhelming, even to those with human rights, human rights expertise, the sheer number of recommendations, judgments, uh, substantive considerations from a wide range of international instruments that parliamentarians need to grapple with. Um, and so it's very important to try and approach that rather overwhelming landscape uh, through a very clear framework. Um, and I think that's why one of the reasons why it's so important that there is a specialised human rights committee in every parliament that can take the lead in, in mapping out that framework um, and can help the other less specialist committees uh, to identify the, their points of engagement with that international human rights framework. And this is something we'll, I'm sure we'll explore in more detail about the importance of mainstreaming um, and how that is, can be combined with a specialised human rights committee. But I think the role of the specialised human rights committee uh, is to make sense of that um, rather overwhelming landscape and the complexity of it by pro providing um, a very clearly understandable framework for other parliamentarians in its parliament. The way in which I would suggest is poss possibly the best way in um, is to take the UPR, the Universal Periodic Review process, uh, particularly because in the current cycle we're particularly well situated as far as the UK is concerned. Uh, we've just had just over 200 recommendations from the Human Rights Council uh, to the UK um, as a result of the UK's third Universal Periodic Review. Um, that's a, an overarching um, pr review process uh, which has generated a number of recommendations which cut across very many different areas. And I think that, for me, would be the entry point I would recommend for, for your committee uh, through those recommendations, um, identifying the recommendations which are those which your committee can best take forward, um, identifying those which other committees perhaps are better placed to take forward in substantive policy areas, um, but also identifying ways in which the other committees, as well as your committee, can engage with that follow-up process. And that will then lead, I think, through that framework of the UPR recommendations to a more substantive engagement with the more detailed concluding observations of specific treaties. So I would recommend that as being the, the window, as it were, uh, through which to approach the, the task, which you rightly say it can be rather overwhelming. That's very helpful. Uh, Jamie Green. Uh, thank you, convener, and uh, good morning. Um, good morning. I I wondered if uh, we, are, we are a relatively new parliament in the grand scheme of things, and this is a relatively new committee uh, in the grand scheme of things. I wondered, uh, given your vast experience of working within other jurisdictions and parliaments, um, if you had any suggestions of best practice or things that, that the other parliaments have learned in, 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 in this process that perhaps would be pertinent to us so that we perhaps don't go through some of those teething problems in this committee that other parliaments have gone through? Yes, there, there, there is an increasing number of collections of good practices, fortunately. Uh, so a number of international bodies, the IPU uh, and the Commonwealth, um, have been doing a very good service in actually collecting um, examples of good practice from around the world. Uh, and they are, they are steadily growing, as I think um, more and more parliaments realise they've got a very important role to play. Um, so there are some now quite useful and some soon to be published, I think, collections of good practice. Um, for me, in the 
draft principles and guidelines on the role of parliaments in relation to rule of law and human rights, which the Scottish Human Rights Commission has referred to uh, in its submission to the Commission. I tried to distill from my experience and my experience of um, working with other parliaments um, what, the, what the really main crucial features of, of best practice um, are um, in order to try and help parliaments that want to, to do this, not in a prescriptive way, but to try and help parliaments which, uh, which want to try to do this. And if I had to focus on the, uh, the headlines um, from those principles and guidelines, I would say one of the most important things of all is to um, ensure that having a specialised human rights committee, which is absolutely central in my view and absolutely necessary, and of course that's the um, mustn't be an obstacle to the mainstreaming of human rights across the whole parliament. And there is a danger, of course, that a specialised human rights committee can encourage others in the parliament to think, well, we'll leave all that to the human rights committee because they're the experts, they're the ones who know what they're doing. Um, and I think the way around that um, is for the, human right, the specialised human rights committee um, to regard itself as having a, a special responsibility in relation to mainstreaming. So as well as dealing with certain things that only that committee, because of its expertise, is, can really deal with or is best placed to deal with, I think it also needs to assume a responsibility for identifying other opportunities for other committees to engage with the international human rights framework. So if, for example, uh, there's a recommendation in the latest UPR um, review recommendations uh, which concerns the criminal justice system, that may be a matter which is actually best dealt with in the Scottish Parliament by the Justice Committee. Um, but for the Justice Committee to engage with that, it may be necessary or it may be assisted at least by your committee and the expertise at its disposal, identifying the point of engagement for that committee uh, and proactively trying to encourage that engagement. So I see the role of the Human Rights Committee um, as including an important role as being an engine of, of mainstreaming, helping other committees uh, to identify how to engage and helping uh, generally the, the Parliament as a whole to identify those points of engagement. If I could add one follow-up um, point to that, I think in, in order to um, cultivate that as a best practice, it's also... If you can hear me, we've lost you temporarily, so um, we'll try and come back to you. Okay. That's a good question. Does anyone else want to come in? You've got to follow up. Yeah. Oh, and we're back. Are we, are we back in public as well? Are we live? Yeah. Murray, forgive us. I think we lost you there for a second. Um, no problem. Do you want to just um, dial back maybe sort of 30 seconds and continue? 30 seconds. So I, I, I just finished, I think, saying um, that the important role of the Human Rights Committee is to be an engine of mainstreaming. And I just wanted to add one additional observation to that, that that requires the committee itself to be quite proactive uh, in its relations with other committees and within the Parliament, which I know from my own experience can be uh, a slightly delicate matter uh, for a committee because there's always concerns about uh, treading on other committees' toes, but it's necessary to cultivate that relationship. But it also requires, and this I think is absolutely crucial, it also requires the expertise which is available uh, to your committee, um, including human rights law expertise, including human rights policy expertise, uh, to be proactively available, proactively deployed um, and deployable uh, to those other committees uh, in order to help them to identify those opportunities for engagement. That's great. And I believe, Jamie, you've got a supplementary on that as well. Uh, thank, you, up. thank you, Convener. Uh, thank you for that very comprehensive uh, response. I find that very helpful, and I think that there's a lot of nodding heads around the table here uh, on, on what you've just said. I think just to follow up with a, sp a specific e example, and maybe you could advise us on best practice, is it more appropriate that on a number of portfolio issues, such as health, justice, housing, education, that the equality and Human Rights Committee holds that relevant... Uh, can the gentleman hear me, or is it...? No, OK. Can, uh, can you. you hear me OK? No? Oh, the screen's gone blank. Oh, I'll, I'll wait a second. Exciting for us to be doing this with the International Space Station. Oh, I see. Do you want to suspend? Suspend everything. OK. Can we suspend for temporarily?
Yeah, Murray, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you, thank you. We can't hear him. Try again, Murray. I can hear you, can Great. you hear me? Excellent, we're back. So, Jamie. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll make the question brief. Uh, is it better for, the, for this committee to uh, hold government ministers and, by default, government departments to account within the confines of this committee on other portfolios, or is it better served in those committees with uh, uh, them focusing on the equalities, the quality uh, repercussions of policy decisions that those portfolio holders make? I hope that makes sense, that question. So is it better for us to request those committees to do that and we advise them on the best way to do that? Or is it, is it more productive within our committee to have the Justice Minister, the, the Minister for Local Housing, Education, Health and so on, tell us about equalities mainstreaming within their portfolios? Mm. I think the, the ideal end state for me would be that human rights would be so mainstreamed across everything that Parliament does that all those committees will be doing that job uh, in relation to the, the Minister in their particular portfolio. Um, now, obviously, that doesn't happen overnight. Um, so it's probably the case that, especially with human rights having been uh, added to your committee's remit relatively recently, that there will need to be a sort of transitional, um, a transitional phase where uh, it's necessary to take things as they come to a certain extent, but with that end state uh, as, the, as the ultimate goal. Um, so that, that may mean, for example, that there will be certain areas that, um, where there's great overlap between your, your portfolio and the portfolio of, say, the Justice Committee um, on a matter like prisoner voting, for example, um, but where the interest of the Human Rights Committee is so great um, that it's appropriate for, for you to, to, to specialise and to perhaps lead in the first instance on that, um, but that eventually those sorts of issues will be dealt with in, in the relevant specialist committee. Uh, ideally. So I, I envisage there will be something of a, of a transitional period uh, where there'll be a sort of feeling um, as you go along uh, on a sort of case by case basis. Um, and it's necessary then to sort of cultivate this uh, relationship with other committees where that's not seen as a, as a, as a, as a territorial conflict. Um, and I think the way is eased to that if your expertise is deployable across committees um, so that there isn't rivalry about the claim on the expertise. Good to hear. Mary Fee. Thank you, Convener, and good morning, um, Mr Hunt. My question follows on quite nicely from Jamie Green's question. Across the Parliament, we have in, in individual committees rapporteurs that look at particular issues. We have European rapporteurs. Do you think it would be beneficial to have rapporteurs in individual committees that specifically had human rights as, as part of the remit so that they could feed directly back into the Human Rights Committee? Yes, I do very much so. I think I think the idea of uh, human rights rapporteurs is is an excellent one. I was very pleased to see that in the uh, in the Commission on Parliamentary Reforms um, report. Um, I think that that again will help very much the the, the mainstreaming effort um, to have a, a point of contact uh, within the membership of another committee on human rights issues um, is a very important I think institutional provision um, to make to make that mainstreaming possible. Um, so I think that's, that is very, very important. It may not be necessary on every committee, but certainly um, on the most relevant committees where human rights issues come up in their portfolio, uh, a human rights rapporteur would, I think, be uh, a great benefit. Um, and I would also add to that, um, as well as a member of that committee, it would also be very useful to identify uh, a member of the support staff for that committee, uh, who was also the sort of main point of contact and encourage as much um, collaboration and uh, sharing of information between those points of contact at the staff level uh, as well as at member level. That's very uh, useful. Do you think in addition to that, the, the, if we do have individual rapporteurs on individual committees, that the, the, there is a need for some kind of training, given the, the breadth and complexity of, of, of human rights legislation? And, and as we go forward with Brexit, um, the implications for human rights in this country perhaps may become more advanced, that there is a need for training for people that look at human rights? Yes, the tra training is always extremely difficult, I think, uh, for members, because members are so busy, um, having, having worked for many years with, uh, with members of the Westminster Parliament. I know that the claims on all your time um, are far more than there are hours in the week. 
Um, and so abstract training, I think, always poses a difficulty for members. And there's a, a constant problem everywhere, I think, um, in, in getting members to attend um, abstract training. Um, but, but I do think that training is, is very necessary. I'm, I'm a great believer, actually, of training on the job. Um, and I think it's possible, especially with proactive secretariats, um, to combine uh, an element of training of members um, as they go along and as they're doing the role, um, which makes it much easier to, for them to find the time to do it. So I think a self-conscious approach to and a reflective approach to, um, say, developing the role of the rapporteur, um, supported by staff who have themselves done the training, it's much easier for staff to find the time to do the training. Um, I think that's probably the way to do it. Certainly in the Westminster Parliament, any attempts we've um, made to provide training for members um, have generally speaking not uh, reached very many uh, members. Um, and in fact, the, the much more effective way uh, of training members, um, training is probably the wrong word, but um, spreading understanding about concepts like the rule of law has been through the activity of all party parliamentary groups. Um, and I know um, there are many cross party groups in your parliament as well. Um, and I think organising um, events through all party parliamentary groups or cross party groups on very topical issues, which are seen through, which are approached in that meeting through a human rights framework or a rule of law framework. Uh, is a very good way of engaging members, see, getting them to see things through the different lens that a human rights framework or a, a rule of law framework gives them. Uh, and so I'm, I'm more in favour of that sort of um, uh, training, if you like, uh, than, than a sort of training course as it works. I think it's, uh, it's unrealistic really for members to, to expect members to engage with that. OK, thank you. Thank you. Gail Ross. Thank you, convener. Good morning, Mr Hunt. Um, in the Scottish Human Rights Commission submission to the Commission on Parliamentary Reform, um, in section 3.1, it says that the, um, there are limitations in the Scotland Act um, in terms of ensuring that the Parliament is able to fulfil its human rights mandate to protect, respect and fulfil human rights throughout all of the Parliament's functions. Could you maybe explain that to us a little bit more? And do you have any advice on... on how we overcome these limitations if they're set down in legislation? Yes, it's a very, it's a very interesting question. It's something I've been uh, interested in and, and curious about, um, whether um, under the devolution legislation, uh, the way in which uh, the human rights compatibility or the ECHR compatibility question uh, needs to be addressed prior to a bill's introduction um, is... Uh, an obstacle to parliamentary consideration and discussion of whether a bill is actually compatible with the ECHR. Um, now, uh, I don't think that there is actually an obstacle in the legislation. I don't think we need to change anything uh, in the Scotland Act, but I do think we need to look carefully at the practices to see whether there's a way round to what could, in practice, be an obstacle. Um, obviously, the, the Commission, I think, in that part of its report um, has suggested that the legal advice which the presiding officer receives um, before the bill is introduced uh, be made public um, and that that would facilitate more consideration by the parliament um, of the human rights compatibility of the bill. Um, now, that's one of the few points in the Scottish Human Rights Commission's um, submission uh, with which I don't agree. Uh, and I don't think it's necessary for that legal advice to be made public in order to facilitate more parliamentary scrutiny uh, and debate. For me, the, the crucial document is actually the policy memorandum, um, which the promoter of the bill has to introduce. And if I can just explain that a little bit, um, the, the way in which the Joint Committee on Human Rights in the Westminster Parliament um, approached this question um, was not to ask for um, the minister's legal advice before they signed the Section 19 statement uh, of compatibility, um, but rather to ask for a, a fuller explanation um, in the, first of all, in the explanatory notes accompanying the bill of why the minister thinks the bill is compatible. Uh, so, so the starting point, our starting point in Westminster was that the government is entitled to legal professional privilege, and I think that's, a, that's just a necessary starting point. So we don't expect to see legal advice as such. But over time, we persuaded government departments that it was actually in their interests to show the working behind the Section 19 Statement of Compatibility. Um, and we've now reached the point in the Westminster Parliament where we receive um, detailed human rights memoranda, which are based on the advice which goes to ministers, which enables the minister to sign the Section 19 Statement of Compatibility, but which has taken out anything which is legally privileged, uh, but which nevertheless contains a great deal of the legal analysis, because departments, I think, have realised that it's 
in their interest, partly to avoid too many pesky questions from the Joint Committee on Human Rights uh, about things they've already considered, um, to put that in the public domain. Um, and we now receive very extensive um, human rights memoranda which address the EHR questions and have also broadened in some cases to consider UN Convention on the Rights of the Child and other international instruments. And I think that's the, the way forward um, to concentrate not on the legal advice that the presiding officer receives, but rather the policy memorandum, which I've seen a reference somewhere to the, the policy memorandum generally containing the only one to seven paragraphs explaining uh, the human rights compatibility of the bill. Um, and I think that policy memorandum could be expanded over time um, if the right questions are asked of the promoter of the bill um, with a template of a human rights memorandum. And that's the crucial document which enables and facilitates parliamentary scrutiny and debate. So I think that for me would be the way forward to work out how to make that policy memorandum address in more detail uh, the human rights compatibility of the bill. Okay, um, thank you for that. Um, as you, you mentioned earlier, this is the, the first time that human rights has been given um, a, a place in a committee um, in the Scottish Parliament, and obviously we're the Equalities and Human Rights Committee. Do you see a place for a human rights committee on its own, or do you think that it's compatible with equalities and we should keep it as it is? I think it's perfectly compatible with, with equalities. And if the specialised human rights committee is going to be combined with another subject matter, it seems to me that equalities is the is the best one for it to be combined with. Um, I think in, in response to your question, the abstract answer, if we had a blank sheet of paper for every parliament would be an individual specialised human rights committee would be the ideal. But of course, every parliament is different and uh, parliaments are of different sizes and have different resources. Member time is at a premium in smaller parliaments. Uh, so I think we have to be realistic about this and not necessarily say there's there's one size that fits all. Um, I think combining human rights with equalities in one portfolio um, is is perfectly uh, a perfectly good way of doing things. Um, particularly if the committee takes seriously what I described earlier as the sort of engine of mainstreaming role uh, and actually is proactive in trying to encourage other committees and helping other committees uh, to themselves get engaged on human rights issues. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Gail. Um, going back, you mentioned in your last answer the written views of the Scottish Human Rights Commission in terms of the uh, Commission on Parliamentary Reform. Recommendation 20 of that um, suggests that this, uh, the Parliament undertake uh, systematic scrutiny of the Scottish Government's response to court judgments concerning human rights. Um, are you aware of uh, parliaments which do that as a matter of course? How effective is it and how big a job is it as well? Because I, you know, even though my background is in human rights, I, I'm not really aware of just how many judgments there are concerning human rights. And if we were to undertake that, how arduous a task would that be? Mm. Mm. I think it's a, it's a very good question. For, for me, it's an extremely important uh, part of the task uh, of a human rights committee and of parliaments, um, precisely because, uh, as I as I said in my uh, the outset, um, one of the problems I think we face is this concern that um, parliaments are being bypassed by courts and courts are having the final say on human rights matters. Whereas in fact, most human rights judgments uh, leave an enormous amount of space for political uh, decision-making and choice and discretion after the judgment. There are very few judgments which actually prescribe a particular outcome. Some do, but very, very few in the human rights context. So the role of parliament following a judgment is very important. Uh, and I think it's very important for not only parliamentarians, but the public to understand that, that the ball then goes back to the, the parliamentary court. Um, and there's still a lot to be decided following a judgment. Um, and I think that's very important, therefore, that parliaments themselves get involved in what should happen now following a judgment. Um, the number of uh, judgments which require some parliamentary involvement um, is is relatively manageable. I think it's it's it's. It's impossible to put a number on it in any one system, but uh, but it's certainly manageable. Um, and again, if, if, if this can be done in the first instance by the Specialised Human Rights Committee, which can develop a, over time a template for identifying the points which the Parliament needs to address, and then send those points to the other relevant committees, uh, which may be better placed to question their minister about why they're not doing this or that in response to the judgment. Um, there are some other parliaments which do this, and the Parliamentary Assembly on the, uh, of the Council of Europe um, has been very uh, strong in recommending that the member states of the Council of Europe develop mechanisms within their national parliaments to follow up 
judgments of the Strasbourg Court. Uh, and there are now some, some examples from other countries which the Parliamentary Assembly um, has gathered in some of its reports where mechanisms are being established in some of the 47 Council of Europe member states to follow up on Strasbourg Court judgments. Um, for me, that's one... I didn't suspend the session until we can re-establish connection. Can you, can you hear us, Murray? Oh, I can hear you again. Excellent, yes. excellent. If we can come back into session, that'd be great. Um, Murray, we lost you when you were just starting to tell us about um, the Strasbourg court judgments yeah. and how they're applied. Yes, so uh, there, there are now some mechanisms in some of the member states of the Council of Europe uh, for specifically following up um, Strasbourg court judgments. Um, and there are some, uh, some quite good examples of parliaments beginning to do that. Um, for me, Strasbourg Court judgments obviously are one important uh, source that human rights committees need to have regard to. But of course, judgments of national courts often raise questions which parliaments need to get involved in following judgments as well. Uh, so national judgments on human rights also uh, very important. Um, and this is really all of a piece with uh, what your first question concerned, which is uh, other recommendations from international human rights treaty bodies. Um, what should be the response to these recommendations? Judgments obviously are uh, particularly important because they are legally binding um, on the state um, and parliaments have an important role in deciding how to respond to those judgments. So they, they are at the top of the priority list. Um, but the questions that that raises are very similar to the questions of how should parliament get involved after treaty body recommendations or special rapporteur recommendations or UPR recommendations. So they're all really of a piece. Um, and uh, a, a solution uh, can be, I think, tailored, fashioned, uh, which, which deals with all of these different sources um, of international um, human rights norms that the, committee, that the Parliament needs to grapple with. Before I come in with a follow-up, I should remind uh, members of my register of interest, having been the past convener of the Scottish Alliance for Human Rights and sitting on the Scottish National Action Plan on Human Rights. Um, one of the reasons we have... Uh, few enough court judgments to respond to is that there is still um, an absence of access to justice around human rights because so many of these treaties that we have are not actually incorporated into Scots law that we um, we are signatories in principle to the, the general idea of these treaties but we aren't actually legislating to give people access to justice through the courts. Um, do you think that incorporation of for example, the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, um, would be a way of sweeping up all of our outstanding obligations that the uh, periodic review identifies. Um, will it, would that give us the appropriate access to justice, or is do we have to do? Uh, is that too simplistic? Mm. Yes, I, I think the incorporation question is always a very a very difficult one um, because the. Political reality, I think, for many years has been that there's a, a reluctance at the Westminster level uh, to incorporate further international human rights treaties. Uh, I've been very used to trying to find ways of making them more effective, um, of instantiating them more into policy making and decision making um, without them being incorporated. Um, and I think there is a there is a tendency to think incorporation uh, would cure everything overnight, uh, which, of course, uh, it wouldn't do. And with something like the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, uh, there are undoubtedly uh, some provisions which don't necessarily immediately lend themselves to enforceable legal remedies. Um, so I, I, I would shy away from seeing it as a as a um, an immediate uh, panacea. Um, but I do think there are a, a huge number of ways in which Parliament's getting more involved in implementing what's in these treaties um, will actually go very far down the road that incorporation would, uh, would get us to. Um, and just to take the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child uh, as an example, um, you have, of course, uh, your, your own legislation um, which imposes a, a duty uh, on ministers in relation to having regard to the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child and keeping policy under review and so on. Um, that's a very important um, way of giving Parliament a role of scrutinising what the government is doing in terms of implementing some of those positive obligations. 
Um, and that's something we don't have in England and Wales. Well, in, in England, I should say, Wales does actually have something, but uh, in, in England, we don't have it. And the Joint Committee on Human Rights uh, used your model and the Welsh model um, to recommend an amendment to the Children and Social Work Bill in the last Parliament um, to try and give that, um, impose that duty on ministers in order to facilitate parliamentary scrutiny of what ministers are doing. Um, and I think um, many of these treaties, like the UNCRC, um, do require active steps to implement them. And that sort of duty in your Children Act um, is a very important way that Parliament can help to implement them uh, and can, again, bring into the political process uh, serious scrutiny of what the state has signed up to do in these international treaties. So for my part, my energies would be spent uh, on trying to enhance Parliament's uh, role in actually implementing the obligations which have been assumed by the state in these treaties, uh, rather than thinking that incorporation uh, is, a, is a, a, a quick and easy answer, particularly because, of course, incorporation um, may enhance legal remedies to some extent, but it doesn't solve the problem of greater political participation in the, in the issues which these raise. So it's just an arrow in the quiver, um, as it were. If, well, thank you for that. Does anyone want to follow up on that before I move on to questions about budgetary scrutiny? Okay. Um, Murray, one of the things this committee is tasked with every year is looking at the budget, the draft Scottish budget, or the work towards the draft Scottish budget through an equalities and human rights lens. And um, it, we, we do quite well in that. We, get, we have some very in-depth discussions and submissions of evidence to that end. Um, one of the things I think is fair to say, because we're so new in terms of the human rights responsibilities of this committee, is that that focus has been predominantly equalities-based. Um, how would you recommend that we we go about looking at any a, a draft budget through an equal, uh, through, sorry through a human rights lens I think that's a, a very very important question and I'm afraid it's one to which I don't have an easy answer because I have very little experience because at the Westminster Parliament uh, we simply haven't gone down that road um, it's something on which I think there is an urgent need to address how do parliaments apply uh, a human rights lens to budget scrutiny um, and I saw a reference in, in some of the papers that I read before today's hearing uh, to this perhaps being a further inquiry by your committee. And I think it is certainly worthy of a very detailed consideration. There, is, there has been some very good academic work uh, done on budget analysis through a human rights lens. Um, I tried at the Westminster Parliament to uh, interest um, the Secretariat of the Treasury Committee um, in incorporating a human rights dimension to uh, budget scrutiny. But it was very difficult uh, for me to um, persuade uh, the Secretary of the Treasury Committee that this was something which was their concern and of, of their business. Um, and again, this, this is one of the things that um, uh, mainstreaming often comes up against these obstacles. Um, how, how are the human rights relevant to what the Treasury Committee does when it scrutinises the budget? So I don't have an easy answer to your question. I think it's a very important question to, to ask, and I think it would be a very, very good subject of a further inquiry. Um, I think incorporating it in conjunction with committees which do the detailed scrutiny of the budget um, would be the way to do it. Um, and so I think this is something where uh, I imagine your committee uh, isn't most expert, uh, expert in many things, but not expert uh, in, as a committee uh, in scrutinising budgets. Uh, and so it's something which really needs to be incorporated into uh, the, the committees which really do do the budgetary scrutiny. Uh, so it's a, I think and I think it's probably the biggest uh, challenge as far as mainstreaming is concerned, because quite often it's the case that people don't really uh, see how human rights has any relevance. But of course, so many of the human rights obligations in these unincorporated treaties impose positive obligations on the state uh, to actually do things. Many of the recommendations of the uh, treaty bodies uh, and of the Human Rights Council in the UPR uh, require the state to spend some money. Uh, and we have to just face up to the fact that the state has assumed a lot of obligations, some of which are quite expensive. So we do need to work out um, how we make sure that that doesn't go unscrutinised uh, in, our, in our parliaments. Well, thank you for that, Murray. Um, and the clerks have asked me if we could get a note of that academic work that you referred to in respect of budget scrutiny, either if you want to tell us now or just email it to the clerks. Um, after, of course, I, I, can uh, certainly, I, can, I can very easily send that to the clerks, yes. I'll that'd that. be very welcome. Um, if I can move on to the, the issues you've just explored around mainstreaming, I think the baseline mm -hmm. that we're at in the Scottish Parliament is that every legislation has an equalities impact assessment put, carried out on it, and more recently, 
following part one of the Children and Young People's Act, um, a children's rights impact assessment. That's really the limit of what we're doing. Now, I think this committee is in the business of future-proofing human rights for perhaps less progressive parliaments that may emerge in the future so that we have this built into the fabric. Um, but it's fair to say, you know, both having been a lobbyist trying to influence those processes and since becoming a parliamentarian, that sometimes a degree of lip service is paid to both, and it, it is a tick-box exercise. Now, some legislation just doesn't really... Uh, isn't really relevant to that, and I accept that, and they still need to carry it out. But how do we... Um, improve that, make that a living, breathing function of the parliament so that, you know, that whether that's at a government level or through the institutions of this parliament, mm -hmm. that we actually make those processes meaningful or add to them. Mm. Again, I think that's a, a, a very, very pertinent question. The, the trouble with uh, impact assessment uh, is that without the bureaucratic uh, will and commitment they do turn into tick box exercises very readily. Um, and they're seen as just another um, pesky bureaucratic requirement um, that, a, that a decision maker has to go through. Um, and so the, the, the key, I think, is, is, is to work with uh, the departments which are producing the bills uh, to make sure that this consideration of human rights matters and human rights obligations and relevant human rights standards uh, is again mainstreamed, embedded in their policy formation process at the earliest possible stage. Now, impact assessment is one way uh, of doing that. Um, <laughs> impact assessment for me carries another um, risk as well as the bureaucratic tick box exercise problem, which is that it tends to make civil servants rather defensive and think in terms of compliance and um, uh, purely sort of negative, uh, are we doing anything wrong here? Um, and I much prefer an approach which looks um, much more positively, not just at uh, whether a bill um, is going to get caught out for doing something which is incompatible with human rights, but whether, as they often are, it's actually positively doing something to advance and promote human rights. Um, and so I've, in my dealings with bill teams um, in Westminster, um, have been very keen to encourage them to think about not just um, impact assessment, but opportunity assessment, um, and to explain in their memoranda um, what opportunities are being taken in this bill to advance and promote human rights. And very often the rationale for a piece of legislation is actually a human rights, includes a human rights advancing rationale. Um, and once we encourage civil servants to think in terms of, uh, in positive terms of how they're promoting changes, um, and, and they think they tend to think less in terms of negative uh, compliance um, and they engage much more uh, proactively and much more positively with uh, the human rights framework. So I think it goes back to the policy memorandum um, and the importance of the policy memorandum. Um, if we can encourage the promoters of bills, including government departments, to frame their policy memorandum in a way which identifies the positive human rights um, benefits and advantages of a particular piece of legislation, as well as identifying possible problems, um, then that is, gets us off first base. Um, so I think that the, the whole, the template for that sort of policy memorandum is a really crucial... Uh Can we suspend while we re-establish connection? You with us? Can you hear I'm us? with you again. Yeah, excellent. Hi. Fantastic. So um, I think we lost you. Yeah, do you just pick up where you left off. I was just, I was just saying I think we, we need to, it goes back to the policy, the importance of the policy memorandum, and I think we need to uh, build on uh, impact assessment methodologies uh, to see how they can incorporate um, opportunity um, identification uh, for the promoters of bills and, and departments. And that does change the, the, the whole framework uh, in which human rights scrutiny takes place. Um, and, and it's particularly fitting for Parliament's role, of course, because Parliament has this particular uh, responsibility, but also capacity to set the legal framework and to um, follow up where a, a, a treaty obligation requires positive steps. Um, it can actually take the implementing measures. Um, and so parliaments often uh, should be more interested, really, not in whether 
uh, a bill is interfering with human rights, but whether it's actually missed an opportunity to advance human rights or whether it's gone far enough in advancing human rights. And again, if we do this through the UPR framework, with all the recommendations understood by the Specialised Human Rights Committee, uh, it's well placed to, to, to identify the opportunity. Suspend again, just while we re-establish connection. And we're back. Hi, Murray. Thank you for sticking with us and persevering. And do, do you were just finishing your remarks on the uh, opportunity assessments, which I think we were all just in the margin there, very interested in as a proactive step we could take forward. Mm -hmm. So uh, please, by all means, continue. Um, no, I think, that and I was really just saying that I, I think the, the, the Specialised Human Rights Committee um, is is very well placed be, uh, if it's familiar with the wide range of recommendations contained in treaty body concluding observations and outstanding judgments and so on uh, to identify those opportunities. Uh, so it can often work um, with uh, government departments that are bringing forward bills uh, to encourage them to explain what they're trying to do in that framework. And, and often I've found in my experience uh, bill teams don't realise that something they're bringing forward in a bill is actually implementing a recommendation or going towards implementing a recommendation. Um, and once that uh, different way of approaching things um, is, is in place, it, it enables much better uh, scrutiny, a much more engaged um, uh, ministerial and departmental engagement with Parliament. Fantastic. Thank you, Murray. Murray, you wanted to come back. Thank you, um, convener. I, um, I, I share the frustration of the convener in relation to um, equality impact assessments and, and the lip service that, that is paid to them. And, and I just wondered what your view is on, is, is there a way that we can change impact assessments to make them more relevant? Is, is there a standard format in the way that we need to carry them out? Or, or could we in, in, in the parliament here make changes? The difficulty, I think, lies in the culture in the departments. I think this is the this is why it's so tricky because um, it, so long as so long as the impact assessment is regarded uh, as something which is has to be done um, at the end of the process, as it were, beginning of policy formation. Um, so I think I, there isn't. I don't think there's an easy answer. Um, it's, it, it requires a cultural change, and in a way that's the Parliament's role, is to bring about that cultural change by asking questions at the earliest stage of policy formation, uh, making the promoters of legislation realise that these things need to be addressed because the answers need to be there. Um, so it's not a very satisfactory answer, but I think it's, it's something that can only, the change can only be brought about uh, by Parliament doing its job uh, of asking those questions, um, which raises another point as well, which is the importance of Parliament and its committees uh, engaging uh, even before bills are being brought forward. Um, so engaging on consultation papers uh, and the human rights questions, which are issues which are raised on consultation papers, uh, and uh, trying to get involved at the very early stage of policy formation in all relevant areas uh, in order to try and um, ask the right questions. Asking the right questions is, is, the, is the absolutely key thing for any human rights committee, identifying those questions and asking them in a, in a public and transparent way. Uh, the earlier that's done in policy formation, the more we'll get to the end state where we don't have uh, tick box impact assessments. So I'm afraid it's a, it's a, it's a long process, uh, but it can, certainly can be accelerated by all committees taking that approach and asking those questions at the earliest possible stage. Okay, thank you. I believe Jamie Green has a final quick question on this as well. Thank you, convener. Um, just following on from what you said, that's very interesting uh, comments around the culture of civil service uh, and perhaps a uh, defensive line that they may take because they feel that when we are pro probing on uh, impact assessments or whether they've taken into account uh, equalities and human rights and their policy decision and application of that policy, there is a often a, d a defense mechanism. What have I done wrong? Why are you asking me these questions? How do we... How do we move to a culture shift where, from a top-down approach, where the ministers, cabinet secretaries, uh, 
the directorates, the director of directorates, and still within their own departments, a positive view that those policy decisions will be taken with equalities and human rights in mind at the beginning of the policy making process, rather than retrospectively at the end as a, what didn't you do at the end of the exercise? Uh, do you have any experience or examples of uh, other civil service departments, for example, in, 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 in Westminster, who have really taken this on board and had a massive culture shift within the department? H how do we ensure that our own government ministers instill that same positivity? Mm -hmm. I think I'll come back to whether there are any, any really good uh, practice examples um, from in the uh, UK government. Um, <clears throat> I think one of the crucial levers to achieving the cultural change um, is to persuade, in the first instance, um, civil servants um, and also hopefully eventually ministers. But it's actually in the government's interest to encourage parliamentary debate about the human rights compatibility of legislation. And this is something which I think um, is little understood, but increasingly there are signs that it's becoming understood, that courts are increasingly influenced by the amount of democratic consideration and debate there has been of laws before they've actually been enacted. Um, and under the doctrine of the margin of appreciation in human rights law, um, it's clearly a consideration which the, the Strasbourg court increasingly has regard to. Um, not as a purely procedural matter, have they discussed this and debated it, but on the basis which I think is correct, that laws are likely to be more, uh, to be better and to be more democratically defensible um, if the difficult balances which they strike have been properly debated in parliaments. And what I've found that the bill teams which are most engaging, most encouraging, most, most forthcoming in the information they provide about the human rights compatibility of legislation are the ones which have understood that message. And the best example I can give um, is uh, in relation to a Home Office Bill, the Protection of Freedoms Bill, um, which uh, implemented the uh, MARPA judgment, um, the Strasbourg Court judgment in, in, in MARPA and the DNA database. Um, and there's a, a passage in the Human Rights Memorandum in relation to that bill, um, which fairly explicitly says that the government recognises that um, if this is uh, the human rights compatibility of this solution is debated uh, in Parliament, that's a, a, a positively good thing and something to be welcomed. Um, and that's based, I think, on this insight that uh, subsidiarity means that uh, courts do give respect to properly taken democratic decisions where there's been proper consideration of, of human rights uh, issues. Uh, not as a purely formalistic thing, uh, but it is clearly relevant. And I think governments are beginning to realise that it's in their interests, therefore, to provide the information and the detail um, of why they think something is compatible, and then positively to encourage there to be parliamentary debate about it uh, and to respond to real concerns which are raised. So I think that's the, the, the biggest lever to the culture change that, that you're, you're describing. In terms of good practice, um, I think probably the Department for Education uh, in Westminster is uh, the, the, the best example um, of a department which has embraced uh, e explaining the compatibility uh, in a positive sense of their legislation uh, with international human rights law, including the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. Uh, there are some very good examples of human rights memoranda uh, from the Department for Education, which they vol voluntarily provided, where they have explained why, in their view, the bill uh, positively promotes children's rights um, and... Uh, uh, if we can suspend briefly, just while we re-establish connection, I think I'm just going to wind this. Murray, I think you're back. Oh God, sorry. Hello? I'm back, yes. Great. Um, we can come back. So, Murray, you were just concluding your answer to Jamie there. Just concluding. I, the, the, I think the Department for Education is probably the best. And I can provide uh, your clerks with some examples of some human rights memoranda uh, which have come from the Department for Education.
which are good examples of positive engagement with UN Convention on the Rights of the Child's requirements uh, and explaining provisions in bills um, in terms of uh, their uh, furthering recommendations in the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child's reports uh, and furthering the UK's implementation of some of the positive obligations in that treaty. Great stuff. Well, Murray, unfortunately, we're going to have to leave it there. But can I thank you first and foremost for uh, persevering with the, the tech? And uh, it's been it's been difficult, but um, very grateful to our audio uh, visual guys as well for helping us along the way. Can I, for one, and I'm sure I speak for the rest of the committee, thank you uh, sincerely for your contribution this morning. It's been incredibly illuminating and actually helped us, um, I think, frame a view as to how we proceed as the human rights guarantor within the parliament. And I hope this will be the beginning of a long and productive relationship with yourself. And we'd like, we'd like to certainly invite you in person to come and see us uh, at, at your earliest opportunity. Can I suspend the session briefly for a very quick comfort break um, and invite the new panel to come and take their seats? Thank you. <laughs>
Welcome back to uh, this session, and I'd like to uh, move on to agenda item two, which is uh, our topic is the departure of the UK from the European Union and the implications for equalities and human rights. So, it's a, obviously this is the next in a series of evidence sessions we're undertaking on the potential impact on Brexit on equalities and human rights in Scotland, and I welcome to the committee, uh, no stranger, Lynn Welsh, who is head of legal in Scotland, um, which is Equality and Human Rights Commission. At the, at the Equality and Human Rights Commission, I should say, and David Cabrelli, who is the Senior Lecturer in Commercial Law at the University of Edinburgh. Welcome to you both, and thank you for taking the time and coming and seeing us today. Obviously, this is a changeable landscape, but I wish, uh, I would hope and ask if, the, in your opening remarks, you could just address as to where you think uh, we are right now in terms of human rights as a landscape in Scotland and what, the, <coughs> what potential changes and implications that Brexit might mean as uh, we move towards departure. Broad, <coughs> broad question. Yes, <laughs> I'm full of them. <laughs> You'll have to excuse me, I'm a bit croakly this morning. Um, <laughs> spread, <laughs> spread our coughs. Um, obviously, the Commission has concerns about the effect of the withdrawal bill um, and Brexit generally on equality and human rights across um, Great Britain at the moment. Um, there is a, an undertaking that neither the Equality Act 2010 nor the Human Rights Act uh, will be uh, changed as a direct result of the EU withdrawal bill. But I suppose our concerns are what happens after um, that and what protections can get built in at this early stage to ensure um, that equality and human rights generally across Britain is preserved, at least, if not enhanced, which would be, um, I suppose, our ideal um, position. You'll have seen from the briefing paper um, that you have before you that we have uh, looked at five amendments, five different areas where we think uh, the bill should be amended um, to try and ensure those protections are, are built into the legislation. And I can take you through those um, if you want me to do that sort of individually. Uh, yes, is that, I, I is that, helpful? that would be very helpful. Yeah. Grant. Um, so the five that we have been looking at in relation to the bill are uh, ruling out the use of, of delegated powers to amend equality and human rights law, um, uh, including a principle of non-regression in the legislation, retaining the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights, uh, introducing a new constitutional right to equality, and uh, looking at how the courts can ensure that they continue to take account of EU case law. Um, all of those, I think, uh, have some element of, of devolution issue, if you like, uh, related to them because we have to look at how uh, the Scottish Government, the Scottish Parliament, uh, will be using powers that they receive um, or interacting with the Bill more generally. So if I start with the sort of delegated powers to amend, um, I mean, this has been talked about a lot in the general sense, the Henry VIII clause that allows um, amendment without uh, the need to return to Parliament. Um, we uh, think that is, is not the way to go, especially around equality and human rights um, legislation. Uh, and we're putting forward amendments um, to uh, ensure that those delegated powers can't be used. Now, that will include, um, uh, hopefully, um, stopping those delegated powers being used in the Scottish Parliament um, as well as at Westminster, because at the moment, uh, delegated powers are going to be given to the Scottish Parliament, and we want to ensure that those are not used inappropriately. Um, to, to uh, cut back on uh, the protections that are presently uh, in place. Uh, the principle of, of non-regression is uh, the introduction, in effect, of um, a duty on ministers at Westminster um, to certify the new legislation that they bring in as a result specifically of Brexit does not diminish human rights or equality law. Um, obviously, they have said that uh, those rights will come direct from the EU law as they stand, but it's moving forward what will happen. And uh, a no regression requirement would ensure that, as a direct result of Brexit, at the very least, um, those uh, rights can't be reduced uh, um, as we progress. Um, we would also like, as a lot of organisations have, have said, I know, to retain the protections in the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights. Um, I think that government have indicated, Westminster government have indicated that they believe that most of those rights 
um, are somewhere in UK law or come in through UN treaties, and we don't believe that either of those <coughs> is entirely um, the case. Um, the EU Charter was brought in by the EU because it recognised that all of the law that it was passing required sort of underpinning fundamental principles like of non-discrimination, rights for children, rights to, uh, to an effective remedy when you take uh, EU law cases. Um, and so they created the Charter to ensure that underpinning was there. And if the Charter doesn't come in along with the rest of EU law, then a lot of that underpinning is gone. Um, and some very direct and useful rights uh, available to citizens here will uh, disappear with it. Um, the, it's true, obviously, that, that the uh, UK state has signed up to various international treaties, but generally those are not uh, able to be enforced directly in the courts here, whereas at the moment the EU Charter is. Um, so it is a huge loss um, if that uh, Charter um, is not brought, uh, brought over along with the rest of EU law. Um, to try to help with that, um, we also would uh, seek to see the introduction of a, a constitutional right to equality. And that would work um, somewhat like the Human Rights Act um, it does at the moment, where you have um, a right, um, and through that lens of equality, if you like, Parliament and all public authorities have to consider whether what they are doing, what legislation is being passed, um, will uh, uh, take forward that right to equality. So in the Scottish uh, Government and Parliament, that would be ministers in the way that they give a human rights statement that the legislation is compatible now. Um, that added to that would be a statement that uh, the legislation doesn't breach the uh, right to equality. Um, down south, if uh, legislation would then be challenged, there would be a, a, a finding or could be a finding by the courts that uh, legislation was incompatible with that right to equality. In Scotland, obviously, that would likely lead to um, an ability to, uh, to say that the, law, that the legislation is not law in the way that we can with human rights challenges. Um, so it's building in that direct um, right um, to equality, which again would underpin um, a whole lot of, of the EU uh, law that is being uh, brought over. Um, and the last is around looking at how the uh, European court and the UK courts um, interact. It's been a, a sensitive subject. Um, in a lot of ways. I think there's a general recognition that um, there does need to be some way for courts to look at what's happening in Europe and where they can use um, uh, to the benefit of, of uh, citizens here the sort of case law that's going through. And so we would like to see, it, again, a clause um, included in the bill which um, allows courts in uh, Britain to look to decisions of the European Court uh, where there may be some uh, doubt um, as to what the legislation uh, in Britain means for us. Thank you for that. Before I bring you in, David, I'd just like to pick up on that last issue. I mean, it's fair to say that judgments, international court judgments um, and case law were something of a catalyst to the kind of anti-EU feeling that we had in this country, particularly around things like prisoner voting uh, and the rest of it. Um, how confident are you that we can um, mitigate that and still find a mechanism to look to international case law to ensure that we're not falling far behind? Um, I mean, I, th I think um, it's part of sort of education, uh, perhaps, of, of uh, citizens and governments. Um, in that we're talking about EU rights rather than sort of human rights more generally, and it tends to be that um, sort of human rights court uh, decisions like prisoners voting um, that, that, yes, um, allows headlines to be made in certain places. This is, is slightly different in that it is, it is uh, legislation that is already here in Britain because we coming in through the EU that is being looked at, so it's our, our law, and we're not asking that UK courts um, have to be uh, following what is said in the European Court in relation to legislation. It is much more um, considering what is there, whether they find it helpful. But the, the final decisions, if you like, in relation to all of that will always lie um, with the UK courts. OK. David, would you like to give us your views on how Brexit is going to affect our human rights landscape? Yes. Um, thank you for the opportunity to come here and give evidence before you today. Um, before I say a little bit about the potential impact of Brexit on equality law in the UK, I just want to set the scene with the current legal position, and I do apologise for insulting your intelligence because this is fairly basic uh, law. 
So there's two angles. First of all, the devolution of competence from Westminster to Scotland, I'll cover that. But first of all, what I want to cover is how the interaction between the Westminster Parliament and the European Union is currently framed. So what we can think of is competence uh, you know, to create policy, pass legislation and equality law. It's basically shared between the Westminster uh, government, the Westminster Parliament on the one hand and the EU on the other. And the relevant uh, articles in the European Treaty, the Treaty on the Functioning of the EU, in equality law are Articles 19 and Article 157. Now, both of these articles have direct legal effect between horizontal parties, that's basically between private citizens. So it means that these articles can actually be invoked by a citizen against an employer, for example, in a local court. Now, Article 19 basically enables the EU to pass legislation, European legislation, in relation to equalities law, and there's nine protected characteristics, which I'm sure you're aware of. And the, main, the means by which the EU does that is through European directives rather than regulations, because they seek to achieve rather than maximum harmonisation of equality laws in the EU, but a minimum harmonisation, because they give each country um, scope, essentially, to make decisions as to how they implement the directive in each of their countries. Now, Article 157 is the equal pay measure, which enables um, primarily female employee claimants to claim that they've been paid less than a comparator male. Um, and that's the equal pay or the basis for the equal pay. So these are constitutional rights, but it's essentially a Westminster lending sovereignty uh, to the EU. Now, when we leave the European Union, what then happens is that that sovereignty is repatriated back to Westminster. And the question, I suppose, is, is whether it's retained at Westminster or whether part of it is devolved uh, to Scotland. And that's really an open question. Now, that takes me on to the, the second scene-setting point, which is in relation to the current devolution settlement. Now, I'm sure that you're aware that one of the main areas of equality law that's been devolved by the 2016 Act is the power to legislate in relation to gender representation on uh, public boards. But the, the power is wider than that because it covers each of the nine protected characteristics. So conceivably, it would be possible for the Scottish Government to create policy in respect of the other nine protected characteristics, such as disability, if they want to promote uh, disabled participation in non-executive appointments on public boards, that would be perfectly legal under the current devolution settlement. Um, now, the second area where power is devolved from Westminster to the Scottish Parliament uh, is a little bit tricky from the actual legislation or the wording of the legislation, because it basically says that the Parliament here has the competence to pass legislation on equal opportunities in relation to the Scottish functions of any Scottish public authority, so that would be a local authority or some other public authority, or a cross-border public authority, so an authority that's UK-wide but has a specific Scottish remit. There's then an exception to that where the Parliament doesn't have power. This is where it gets a bit tricky. And that says that competence to amend the Equality Act 2010 is reserved in relation to the Scottish functions of a Scottish public authority or a cross-border public authority. But then there's another exception to that, which says that the Scottish Parliament, however, does have power to pass legislation where they are proposing to introduce legislation that improves upon the rights provided by the Equality Act 2010. Now, what this actually means is a little bit, it's a bit difficult to actually figure out. But I think what it seems to be saying is that where equality law, well, where a Scottish public authority is exercising a public function, so a public sector organisation exercising a devolved competence in relation to Scottish public power, then they can improve upon the rights granted by the Equality Act 2010. So in other words, they can, they can ratchet up uh, the protection. So that's the current position. Now, as for um, Brexit, um, well, ironically, one of the effects, of, you know, there's a lot of potentially or potential downsides to Brexit, but ironically, one of the effects of Brexit is that it would be possible um, for 
well, with, with, the, with the consent of, of Westminster, it would be possible for the Scottish Parliament to introduce positive discrimination measures because at the moment, those are specifically precluded. There's no power in that regard because of EU law. Now, if we leave the EU, and depending on the, um, the settlement with regard to how we take account of European Court of Justice decisions, you know, whether they will simply be persuasive or we don't need to take them into account at all, because they will continue with the embargo or the prohibition on positive discrimination measures. So it depends really on that, but in theory, it would be possible for the Scottish Parliament to pass legislation that promotes um, persons with the nine protected characteristics to the extent that people without those characteristics are discriminated against. In other words, positive discrimination. Because at the moment, that's not possible. It's only possible, what's possible is positive action. Uh, and that's, that's the, the extent of it. So that's one ironic effect uh, of Brexit. Now, as regards, so that, that's within the gift of the Scottish Parliament because it would mean that, gen well, representation of persons with protected characteristics on public boards it would be possible to pass legislation or create policy that enables the Scottish Parliament to positively discriminate in favour of persons of, uh, you know, with disability with, and, and various other characteristics as well. Um, as regards the general impact of Brexit, um, I suspect that if there are no protections in the terms that Lynn Welsh uh, has mentioned in the withdrawal bill, then over a period of years, it's likely, as I've said in the written evidence, that some of the um, current incarnations of the equalities re regime will be diluted. For example, historically, there was a prohibition, or no, there, there was a specific, specific provision uh, in the Disability Discrimination Act between, I think probably between 96, maybe about 2004, that said that small employers did not need to comply with the disability discrimination. I think it was if they had 15 employees um, or, or fewer. Uh, I suspect that over a period of time, legislation may be passed to introduce these small employers' exemptions across the board of the protected characteristics, not just in relation to disability. Um, secondly, what is not possible under the current EU law settlement is for compensation or remedies to be diluted or to be reduced in their, their power. And again, I suspect that that will be something which may be uh, diluted uh, over the course of you know, the next two decades, because we have caps on compensation under the domestic unfair dismissal uh, regime, and it's, it's potential that you know, there's a potential for that to be introduced uh, with equality law um, as well. And also, one of the perennial issues in equality law is who is protected, which individuals are protected. Now, on the face of it, lots of people are protected, but in reality, when you dig deep and look at the law, there are quite a few people who you would think would be protected but are actually excluded. And EU law does currently have a concept of um, the individual who's protected that's very, very broad. But again, the potential would be to narrow that down. Um, and there's a number of ways that would, would be possible, that would be possible to do. Thank you for that. Um, just, uh, I know Mary, if you want to come in, but can I just come in with a, a question on what you've just said? Um, I think one of the things that we focus on in this committee is, is future proofing the processes and policies of this parliament for perhaps less progressive regimes in the future so that we're, they're kind of locked in and it's in the fabric. From what I'm getting, one of the negative outcomes of Brexit is that that future proofing is un unraveled and that actually then successive regimes in the UK, um, ir irrespective of what political hue, um, are unencumbered now from rolling back on some of these provisions and uh, protections that our citizens enjoy. Is that right? Yes. Without, number one, a preamble in the EU withdrawal bill that specifically entrenches the current um, incarnation of the equality regime, or number two, a non-regression clause in the bill, or number three, 
the insertion of a constitutional right to equality. You know, there is an argument that even with these, whether that would be legally sufficient, but let's imagine that they're, they're not there, mm. then there is absolutely nothing to prevent future governments or parliaments from removing or diluting equality, equality rights. Yeah. That's, uh, that's very troubling. Mary Fee. Thank you, um, convener, and, and good morning to you both. I, um, I also sit in the Justice Committee, and earlier um, this week, the Justice Committee were down in Westminster to meet with our counterparts across a, a number of different committees to talk about the impact of Brexit on justice, about access to justice and information sharing, which also has a, a human rights angle to it, because it is all human rights um, related, and, and it, it was fascinating um, the people that we met and, and the views that were expressed. And, and there is huge concern amongst the people that, that we talked to in Westminster around citizen rights. Um, and, and I'd be interested to hear you, your opinion on, on that. And, and there are also concerns that have been raised around um, information sharing in relation to um, trafficking, whether it's trafficking for um, forced labour or, or, or sex trafficking. Um, but, but they also raised a specific concern about the, the Scotland Act and the, um, the references in the Scotland Act to the EU. And there seems to be no indication coming from um, Westminster or, or from the EU what within the Scotland Act will replace the reference to the EU. Will it just be removed? Will something else be put in? Will there be some other um, kind of protection put in? And I'd be interested um, in, in your views on, on that. Um, and I know that's quite a lot I'm, I'm asking you, but it's kind of lots and lots of questions in one. And the other thing I'd particularly like to ask you, Mr um, Cabrelli, um, from, from your paper, I'm interested why you think particularly the, the prohibition of associative discrimination claims m may be affected. And, and I ask you that question, I suppose, because for 12 years I was a lay member of tribunals and we grappled with what is associative. And, and so I'd, I'm, I'm interested in your view on that in particular. So who would like to start in that whole kind of roundup of things? I suppose in, in relation to your, your first comments around your, your experience in the Justice Committee, um, the EU's Royal Bill certainly does, as I've uh, say, said, um, if we lose the Charter, have an effect on human rights, if you like, um, across, across Britain in a way that we would not like to see. The Human Rights Act obviously remains... Um, and there is yet, as yet no change in relation to that legislation or what it means for citizens of, of the UK. And I think we uh, need to be firm on that uh, now and going forward, that those are not diluted in any way. It, it may be a separate argument to come at a different time. I mean, as people think, because we're, with, we're withdrawing from Europe, that all of that will be lost, there is a perception that it's going to go. Yes, Even though we know it, it, it's not. It's not. That's yeah, I, I think that's absolutely true. And I, and I think there's a, a job for organisations like ourselves and others to be clear about the, the rights that still are there um, for individuals such as they are. Um, I think, yes, that is, that is something that we could look at um, and have looked at to some extent as we're going forward. Um, what replaces the reference to EU law in the Scotland Act? Um, I don't know that we have looked at that in detail as yet. I, I, I'm not aware that the UK government has suggested anything as yet in relation to that. Um, I would have presumed that it may just simply be removed. Um, but I'm not sure, this is short. Unhelpful answer, I'm not sure. Okay, thank you. Mr Cabrelli. I'll take the, the first question and then obviously the last one. Uh, the first question strikes me as an issue relating to access to justice. To what extent can citizens access and enforce their equality rights? Now, what's often overlooked is that in each of the European directives, tucked away right at the end, there's a little article or a sub-article that says that when a country, a member state, implements the, that particular equality law in its, its country, its jurisdiction, it must ensure that the enforcement mechanisms are something like uh, effective... Mm -hmm. I can't remember, there's three words, effective and dissuasive. So essentially, it, it really, um, it, it proofs um, the right, well, it protects the right, because it means that citizens in these countries must have an effective means of enforcement. So uh, you, may re you may recall some reports, that, that I think it was at the beginning of the coalition government, where 
there was a report called the Beecroft Report, and in there there were various recommendations made about perhaps limiting the compensation, because at the moment there's no maximum cap for quality claims. But that, that was just precluded. That was a non-starter because of these clauses that are tucked away in the directives, because there has to be absolute access uh, to justice. So once we leave the EU, those clauses will obviously no longer be effective, meaning that, in theory, it would be possible for a future government to place limitations on the uh, compensation that may be claimed, perhaps limit the remedies, and so forth. Uh, having said that, I should, I should note a caveat. And the caveat, you know, if you'd asked me this question before the 26th of July, I would have said that without these protections in the directives, then the government really had power to you know, limit, you know, really make access to justice very, very difficult. But since the 26th of July, my belief in the judiciary and the common law has uh, really been um, restored because the decision in unison which abolished the employment tribunal fees reminded us of the power of the common law to ensure that access to justice is um, something that every citizen enjoys. So that's one caveat. You know, although it looks bad, there may actually be a silver lining, and that's in the guise, ironically, of the common law and the judiciary, which is quite interesting because they reminded us of the, these, these liberties that every citizen has and the importance of access to justice. Now, I think the final point was uh, the impact of leaving the EU on associative and perceptual discrimination. Now, as the Equality Act 2010 is currently worded, associative and perceptual discrimination claims are, it's abundantly clear that they are perfectly legal. Um, however, they are, um, I suppose, what's the word I'm looking for? They're supported and they're buttressed by underlying EU law, which specifically says that associative discrimination and perceptual discrimination, each member state in their legislation must recognise that. Once we leave the EU, then decisions such as Coleman, which was the care, uh, the care um, worker had a disabled son and she was discriminated against and was successful because of discrimination related to the disabled son. And other EU ECJ decisions such as CHEZ, so that's C-H-E-Z, uh, which is the Romanian case about the, um, the meter, the, ele the, the electricity meter, um, these will no longer be part of our law because they ensure that associative discrimination and perceptual discrimination are protected. So once they go, then it means that a future government could amend the Equality Act 2010 to remove them because they are controversial and there's no underlying theory as to how you determine whether someone is associated with another person with a protected characteristic and also how you determine whether someone who is perceived to have a protected characteristic should be protected, and why, you know, why so? But just just uh, it, would, it would take an amendment to the yeah. legislation, yeah. though, because obviously yeah. the you know the court decisions stand as they are. Uh, that includes court decisions in the UK that have followed on from Coleman That's and similar. True. So it would it would take an actual amendment. Yeah, but 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 given how controversial it all is, the, the chances are that nothing will be done. It's a possibility. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's certainly possible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Possible. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Jamie Green, I believe you've got a question. Thank you, Convener. Uh, good morning, panel. Um, I would like to press, uh, or at least explore more, um, uh, Ms. Walsh, your comment around the uh, proposal for a constitutional right to equality. I find that, uh, in principle, an admirable ambition, but I, I, I would like to discuss the practical application or the implications of such. Uh, in in that, is parity achievable for everyone? And I say that in the context of another piece of legislation that we're looking at in the Islands Bill, uh, in that the, there is an expectation that, or an understanding that parity of equality is not always achievable. And an example may be, for example, someone living on an island doesn't have access to the same social care as someone living on the mainland in Scotland, for example. If there was a constitutional right to equality, would that create issues for local authorities, 
public bodies, government uh, bodies, um, in producing policy that was contra to that constitutional right, it could become difficult to govern, difficult to implement, and rather expensive. Do you have any views on that? I, that, it certainly would not be the intention that a, a constitutional right to equality would have that outcome. Um, and I suppose the way that that would be uh, mitigated against would be that you're looking at uh, a non-discrimination clause, which would also contain a right of justification, in, uh, similar to indirect discrimination, for example, does at the moment. So there would always be that balance, I guess, between um, ensuring equality and non-discrimination, but recognising that on some occasions a difference in treatment can be justified. Can I, can I maybe follow up on that? I think... I'm about to say something that sounds very controversial but is actually legally true, so I do put you on notice. There's no such thing in this country as a right to equality. There's only a right to equality if you or someone that you're associated with or you are perceived to have one of nine protected characteristics. So it's not possible for someone to go to an employment tribunal or a court and say, I have been treated less favourably than Lynn Walsh, and they ask me why, and I say, well no particular reason, it's just less favourable treatment. I always have to show that my less favourable treatment or disparate impact that I have suffered is related to one of nine protected characteristics. So if there was a constitutional right to equality, I would imagine that it would follow that same scheme, which would therefore mean that it would be a constitutional right to equality uh, if, you pro if you possess one of the nine protected characteristics. Is that the... Potentially that that's true, but there has certainly been discussion about the constitutional right to equality being wider and mm. following more of a human rights act or human rights convention system, which has a sort of, and any other characteristic, personal characteristic. Um, so in theory, you could use human rights law in the way that you're describing. Um, now, if you use Article 14, discrimination in human rights terms, but again, there are justifications uh, built into that. Um, in relation to, to uh, state action. Um, so it might not just be the nine, okay. but there would still be justification issues. Did you have anyone? Save it. Okay, bring in Mary yeah, Fee. Should, well, I think uh, we're probably okay to oh, move on then. Okay, okay Jamie. Uh, in that case, may uh, we talked in the last session a little bit about um, budget scrutiny <laughs> and scrutiny of gov government. Um, I was very um, intrigued by the submission um, uh, the Scottish Human Rights Commission submission section six uh, around budget scrutiny, and, and I found your comments very helpful and insightful. Um, in 6.3, you say budget analysis is a critical tool for monitoring gaps between policy and action. Uh, but in 6.4, you then go on to say, in monitoring Scottish government spending, the Parliament can, if necessary, hold the government accountable for inadequate performance in the area of human rights. Um, could you explain or enlighten the committee as to what or how you think Parliament can and does or should hold the government to account for inadequate performance? I have seen it very rarely in practice, I think, in my short time in this Parliament. So I'm really intrigued to see what your views are on how we think, uh, sorry, how you think we could do that much better. Our paper, I'm afraid, is the oh, Scottish sorry, Human Rights it? Commission's mm. paper. I do apologise. No, it's, 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 it's a regular confusion it, between be, the Equality and Human Rights welcome. Commission and the Scottish Human Rights Commission. They are our sister organisation, oh, and they're responsible for this paper. It's a very in interesting paper. Uh, uh, <laughs> paper but I'm sure they'll come and explain it to you if you ask. Um, I, I've been, I, I would welcome your views on how you think the, the committee, and indeed Parliament <coughs> in general, um, can ensure that government uh, is held to account if you have any views on it. Uh, uh, I, I, I'm happy to repeat the, the wording they used. Uh, the Parliament can, if necessary, hold the government accountable for inadequate performance in the area of human rights. Um, and as I said, I wonder what practical things we can do as a committee to hold the government to account. I'm sorry, it's not something I've, I've okay. put my uh, mind to for today. My apologies. Um, likewise, I, I could imagine that you, you may construct human rights kind of key performance targets, you know, assess policy and the impact of policy against them. But like, like Lynn, I've not, it's not something that I've given them. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mary. 
Thank you, um, convener. I wonder, perhaps, if you could um, give us your view on the impact <coughs> or the potential impact of, of Brexit on the Working Time Directive, because you'll know the Working Time Directive was hugely beneficial, but also hugely controversial. And a number of organisations, and one I previously worked for, um, jumped through hoops to get people to sign opt-outs and, and thought up all, all sorts of very intriguing ways to ensure that people didn't sign up to it. So what, what do you think the potential implications are for that? I'll go ahead. <laughs> um, so just before I answer your question, I'll just set the scene. So the Working Time Directive... Um, from, two, you know, I think it was introduced in 96 or 98, from recollection. There's two elements to it. First of all, limits, and secondly, rights or entitlements. Limits, the main one is the 48-hour working week. Uh, the difficulty with that is it's more or less ineffective, and that's because there's an opt-out. And the opt-out is built into an employment contract when someone first enters into employment, they sign the contract, and by signing the contract, they effectively opt out of the 48 working week. So even if they don't opt out, there are still various derogations and exceptions. For example, for professionals, they would be exempt because they would be, quote, unmeasured working time workers. And there are other exceptions as well. So the 48-hour week limit is actually quite, you know, it's quite Secondly, uh, there are the entitlements, and there are entitlements to rest breaks, so daily rest breaks, weekly rest breaks, etc., etc., fairly uncontroversial. And then finally, the main right that is quite controversial is the holiday leave, so annual leave and holiday pay. Um, there have been a lot of cases over the past seven years on holiday pay and annual leave, uh, some of which are um, quite extraordinary in the scope of protection that's offered to workers. For example, um, there's no right to, well, there's no right for an employer to pay you rolled up holiday pay, which is essentially um, means that if you're employed for six months, you don't get any holidays and you don't get any holiday pay. Instead, the holiday pay is just added on to your wage and then smoothed out across the six months. Also, uh, if you go on leave, annual leave, then you're entitled to receive your normal ordinary remuneration. That will include commission, that will include voluntary overtime, that will include compulsory uh, overtime, uh, and you can claim for that as part of the um, holiday pay that you receive. Now, these recent cases are all quite controversial, and once we leave the EU, the position regarding the authority of the European Court of Justice and what the settlement and the withdrawal bill will largely determine how we treat these cases which are quite far-reaching in terms of their protective capacity for workers. Um, if we no longer have to have regard to the Court of Justice's decisions, then we will obviously not have the um, future decisions to take into account. The position of the past decisions, okay, uh, we have to you know, honour them, but in reality, as soon as their case comes before the Supreme Court, they can easily depart from the previous jurisprudence of the Court of Justice of the EU, their own jurisprudence, in other words, their own decisions and also the decisions of the lower courts. So effectively, it would be possible for the holiday uh, leave and holiday pay rights to be stripped back. Okay, thank you. I would just, just add that it is one of the areas that we would have uh, concerns about changing relatively quickly. We talked about others before that. They're not, these uh, regulations and rights are not contained in the Equality Act, but they are equality law in the broadest sense. Um, and there is no suggestion presently the withdrawal bill will protect those unless we can build in some of the other protections. OK, thank you. That's helpful. Thank you. Can I ask the panel, um, in respect of the 111 returned powers that are coming back as a result of Brexit, uh, that should technically be devolved to the Scottish Parliament, but obviously that is still a subject of discussion and debate at Westminster, um, number 46 is equal treatment legislation. And that's quite an opaque term. And I, I, for one, have not really got to the bottom of what that means, but it does sound like something we should be interested in as a committee. Can you give us a, a very quick summary of what equal treatment legislation means? 
we have uh, looked at it to, to some extent. You're right, it, it can mean a variety of things, <laughs> depending on where you're starting from. Um, I mean, there, there is equality legislation uh, in Scottish legislation now. Um, so the um, equal opportunities opt-out relates to discrimination. Um, not all equality law relates to discrimination. So there are uh, bits in the housing legislation, for example, that allow tenants to ask for reasonable adjustments. Taxis having to take guide dogs are not discrimination. They're brought in separately in Scottish legislation. Um, specific duties, obviously, are, uh, are also separate. So there are pieces of equality law in Scottish legislation now. So it would certainly apply to those. And there are also, um, as I think your, your note had, had noted, other pieces of EU legislation uh, that bring in rights to accessibility, for example, in transport and other areas for disabled people that are not discrimination and would be uh, uh, brought in through Scottish uh, legislation and action because it would be your job in so far as, as transport and stuff is devolved to ensure that those are met. So I think it covers all of those um, equality areas in the broadest sense that don't directly relate to discrimination that you would find in the Equality Act. Although, of course, as uh, David has, has said, there is now a right also to, to pass discrimination law in Scotland. Um, and and um, so presumably the, 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 that broad term would also include that uh, power that you already have. Would you like to add anything, David? Yeah, so item 46 is, just to correct so, so that I'm absolutely clear, that's the powers that's being repatriated from the EU to Westminster. So, so item 46 is one of the 111 powers which the Scottish Government currently contends should be devolved di directly to the, um, to the Scottish Parliament under the principles of the Constitutional Convention of 1997, um, but obviously is still a matter of discourse at Westminster. I think if we start at the beginning and ask ourselves what happened in 1972 or whenever it was, what happened then was that the UK lent some of its sovereignty to the EU, and one of the areas in which they did that was equality law. So they basically said to the EU, we have the power to pass legislation related to equalities, but so do you. That is now Article 19 in the Treaty on the Functioning of the EU. So I think what, what we can then say is that what is being repatriated back to Westminster is what, is what was passed under Article 19, and that's the Equality Directive. So it's the um, Race Directive of 2000, which is race discrimination. It's the Recast Equality Directive of 2006, which is equal pay and it's also sex discrimination. It's the Framework Directive of 2000, which was sexual orientation, discrimination, also disability, age and religion. Um, and there have been other directives as well, social security directives, also directives in relation to access to services, gender discrimination and access to services. So these are the power, these are the bits of legislation that are essentially, that have been passed under Article 19. They come back to Westminster and the item 46 is saying, well, when it comes back to Westminster, it should then be devolved to the Scottish Parliament. Now, the argument for that would be that some elements of equal opportunities law have been devolved to the Scottish Parliament, but as we know, they're actually quite limited. They're actually, in fact, you know, if I was being honest, they're very limited, the power that the Scottish Parliament has. So, yes, equality is law is devolved, but only a minute element of it. So I think the argument, I can see the argument, but on the other hand, most of the legislative competence at the moment is with Westminster. When the EU competence comes back, it will probably be, you know, 99% and maybe 1% here. But these are just, you know, ballpark figures. But an important 1%, even if it is only yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, well, that's very helpful. I think um, if it's OK with the committee, I'd like to ask the clerks to write to the Scottish Government about this specific issue, just to ascertain what the Scottish Government understand equal treatment legislation to mean, what they hope to get out of um, the repatriation of that power, and if it really is just about equalities, which is largely reserved, um, what their case is for having the whole of that um, uh, item 46 uh, return to Scotland. Any other questions from my colleagues here? Jamie. Thank you. Just a minor one. Can I just confirm, uh, Mr. Cabrelli, this is your contribution? <laughs> yes, it is. Okay, yeah. good. 
Yes. Um, sometimes the labeling of our items is confusing with the codes, so I do apologize. A uh, really interesting um, piece of uh, documentation on Section 37 of Scotland Act 2016. I don't want to go into it in too much detail and, uh, for time purposes, but basically if I jump to your conclusion, uh, where you say that um, on balance, uh, Section 36, 37 of the Scotland Act 2016, in your view, uh, appears to go beyond the recommendations in Smith and as such cast the net of the Scottish Parliament much wider in relation to legislative competence. Just, just uh, Is this a, a, a positive statement or is it a criticism of, of where we're at with Section 37? It's really just a statement of fact, I think. Okay. I'm not really expressing any opinion on the, the desirability of the legal position under Section 37, because Smith was quite clear. It was saying that competence should, in equalities law or equal opportunities law, should be devolved, but only as regards sex discrimination on the boards of public sector organisations, but only in relation to non-executive appointments. But Section 37 doesn't do that. It actually goes beyond that. I'm not, I'm not sure we would completely agree with that because from memory, I don't have it in front of me, Smith said something like the gender representation on board stuff or in fact not gender, all protected characteristics. Mm -hmm. As a minimum, something like that. Um, there was something in it that suggested that it would go further, which is why the Westminster government did put in the, the extended mm -hmm. um, delegation. <coughs> yeah, it was a bit cryptic, I think. Yeah, but that, that's, that's certainly what led the Westminster government to, to go further than just the... Because um, I, I think it's Clause 60 of the Smith Commission, it says... Um, so, yeah, so equal opportunities would be reserved to Westminster, except the introduction of gender quotas in respect of public bodies in Scotland and the power to legislate in relation to socio-economic rights in devolved areas. I think there's probably other parts so as you say of, bit, of the Smith yeah, Commission that something. I overlooked that yeah. refers but I can't you know I, I just saw clause 60 yeah. and on the face of it section 37 does go beyond that there's no there's no doubt about that I guess the rationale for asking is, is the, your opening comments where you said that actually there already is uh, a devolved competence to legislate across all protected characteristics it's not just on the issue of, of, of gender balance or sex sex uh, and and I, I wasn't sure where that competence came from. I was trying to dig deeper as to um, the, the source of that competence, I guess. Yeah, that's basically section 37. And then section 37 then goes on to have all, you know, this, this sort of, you know, elaborate architecture about Scottish public functions and Scottish public authorities and where they can pass legislation and when they can't. And it's a little bit cryptic to be perfectly honest with you. It, it is, but we would encourage the Scottish Government to look at what they can positively do with it. I think as possibilities there, we know it can do things like um, add protected characteristics. Yeah, There's been discussion yeah. around, for example, covering care experience for young people who, who we know are discriminated against in their, in their lives. Um, and although it is restricted very much to public authorities and discrimination, the, hopefully the, the, the the protection from discrimination in that area, that in itself could have huge implications and um, improve the lives um, of people regardless. So we would certainly encourage thought and enthusiasm. Mm. Well, I'd like to thank you both very much indeed for coming this morning. It's uh, been, as ever, a very illuminating session. Um, we clearly have a lot of work to do on this. And if you think of anything that you would have liked to have contributed in respect of our session about Brexit this morning that you didn't get the chance, please do contact us in the future. But I'm sure we'll be seeing a lot more of you both um, as the months go by. So uh, thank you very much. Before I close uh, the formal part of the meeting, I'd just like to say that we did receive notification from Annie Wells during the meeting that she was unable to make it. So we record her apologies. Um, so I suspend this meeting of the, the committee. Thank you. <laughs>